I'm hoping that you enjoyed the series on how to minister effectively to others. Was that helpful to you? I hope it was. A lot of study, a lot of prayer and so forth. Many of you may not have been here last week. I taught on the five-step prayer model. It's out now on, on YouTube and on the church uh, uh, website. I would encourage you to listen to that if you did not hear that because that's how you implement all the things we talked about. But I want to talk about something t- t- different today, a single lesson. Every month this year, and for the last several years we've done this quite a bit, we do something called a soaking service. And for a lot of Christians, you're like, soaking service. What in the world? Do I bring my laundry? What do we do that night? What is a soaking service? service. Now, those who come, and there are many who do, absolutely love it. It's the one thing we do all month long that takes no work other than a sound person. You can come, and you can wear your pajamas on that day. You can bring a pillow. You can bring a blanket. You're just soaking in the presence of God. But if you don't have our kind of church, you're like, what in the world are they doing? Is this some kind of weird doctrine soaking? I don't know about that. So we're going to talk about that today, the power of waiting on God. And I want you to learn or look at a verse. Actually, if you could access this any way you do, phone, Bible, whatever, but go with me to 2 Timothy 3 and verse 1, a familiar verse, but I want to ask you this. Does this verse apply to our life right now? Here's what it says. Paul speaking, 2 Timothy 3.1, but know this. Do you know what that means? We should know this. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Now, the last days actually began on the day of Pentecost. That was the beginning of the last days. How do we know that? Because Peter quoted this, I will pour out my spirit in the last days. It began there. So I would believe these are the last of the last days. I don't know when Jesus is coming back, but I know this every day we are one day closer. And so the Bible says in the last days, perilous times will come. How many of you believe these are perilous times? Four people. How many of you believe these are perilous times that we're living in? Now, the word perilous in the Greek is a word, I'll just spell it, C-H-A-L-E-P-O-S. And actually, the New King James Version margin has a footnote, and it says this, in the last days, times of stress will come. Is that relevant to the hour in which we live? Times of stress. But as I studied that word out, perilous, it means hard, grievous, or difficult. So perilous means hard, grievous, difficult, and it's only found twice in the entire New Testament, this particular Greek word. It is found here in 2 Timothy 3, 1, and one other time. Listen to this. It is found in Matthew 8, verse number 28. And it says this, when Jesus had come to the other side, the other side of the lake, to the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two demon-possessed men. Now think about this, coming out of the tombs, and the next two words are what? Exceedingly fierce. That's the same Greek word as perilous. Exceedingly fierce so that no one could pass that way. So when we see perilous in one verse, it is translated exceedingly fierce in another. Now, another translation says they were so extremely violent. That's the way they put it, extremely violent. And the Arabic Bible says it this way, they, were, they came out of the graveyard extremely evil. So when the Bible says, know this, in the last days, perilous times will come, when you put those different translations together, the Greek together, we could say this, the last days will be perilous, times of stress, hard, difficult, exceedingly fierce, extremely violent, and extremely evil. That's 
the bad news. But here's the good news. God has provided a way for us to walk in peace and victory in the midst of perilous times. How many of you know God's presence is always bigger than anything the devil brings? And here's what Scripture says. The glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. So yes, we are in the world. Yes, it is perilous, difficult, hard, exceedingly fierce. But don't you know, greater is he that is in you. I said, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Now, remember that Palm Olive commercial? I forget the woman's name, but she was working. And what was her name? Madge. And she had you had the woman getting her fingers done, and she was soaking in something. And, and she said, yeah, it was Palm Olive. And they said, what are you doing? So, you're soaking in it. You're soaking. Oh, that, that's Palm Olive. It's okay. You're soaking in it. Where there's something about soaking that makes a difference. A lot of churches are program-based churches, and we're not against programs, but we're actually a presence-based church. We believe in programs, but they don't do anything without the presence of Jesus. We must walk in that presence. And here's the good news. You can do it at church, and there's something about that corporate anointing, but you can do it at home. You can do it in the car. You can do it in your office. Anywhere you are, you call his name. His presence is made manifest. Here's what the scripture says. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water. What's the next three words? By the word. And that he might present to himself a glorious church, and then notice this phrase, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blame. So notice something, if you would. The word soak in the dictionary means to soften, to pour into, to saturate, and to immerse. How many of you would agree that if we are not careful, our hearts can become hardened? because of what's around us, our lives can become embittered. But as we soak in his presence, those things begin to soften. We begin to be saturated in his presence. And here's what the scripture says, just as a husband is, is presented with a wife, and the Bible says she is glorious and beautiful. We just had a wedding yesterday with the Maranowskis, and Julianne got married, and everything was pristine. The dress was perfect, not a spot, not a wrinkle, the hair, the makeup. And as the, as the father came down, he presented her to her husband-to-be without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. And that's the picture. And in the same way, we will be presented to our bridegroom without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. And I believe that happens at the rapture of the church. But notice that phrase, not having spot. Now, I believe there are two things that get out the spots and the wrinkles. The first one is the word of God. And actually, that verse said, it's by the washing of water by the word. The word of God washes your life. It washes your mind. It washes your environment. And so we need washed on a regular basis. How many of you know, if you don't get a shower every day or so, thou stinketh, right? I don't care who you are. I don't care how much you pray or fast. You need to get a shower, a bath, whatever. Why? Because these bodies get stained. They get dirty. It begins to smell. And so you need to, just to let you know, bathing is a good thing, right? So... The reality is we are washed by the word of God. But there's a second way to be washed, and that is by the spirit of God or the presence of God, because here's what the scripture says, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said, 
about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. So Jesus called the Holy Spirit water, living water. So what cleans your life? What helps you with those spots? The Word of God and the Spirit of God, or we would say the presence of God. And we need both of those in our lives. Water refreshes. It cleans. We drink it. We bathe in it. We wash with it. And then Paul calls the body of Christ a glorious church. We may not be all that yet, but I believe that's God's desire, his intent. We are to become that glorious church. And when I say us, the body of Christ at large. To me, a glorious church is a church filled with the glory of God. So how do we get the spots and wrinkles off in our clothing today? We wash out the spots. We iron out the wrinkles. How do we get spots out of our personal lives? Here's what James 1.27 said. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble, to keep oneself What's the next word? Unspotted. Now, their translations say unstained from the world. To keep yourself unspotted or unstained from the world. You see, we get dirty or spotted when we're around the world system. It can cause us to be defiled. It's one thing to be in the world. It is another thing for the world to be in us. So when we have a spot that we cannot get out through the regular wash, we take some time to soak it out. Now, my mother is the master stain soaker. So anyone in our family and even our extended family, especially when the kids were playing sports, GG, I've got this jersey, I've got these pants, I've got this top, I've got this stain, and we don't know she goes into this factory and three or four days later she comes out and it's perfect and it's on a hanger and it's ironed and she is the spot remover. And she's amazing at it. You know, in fact, mama, talk to me. I got a couple of, I was looking at my collars yesterday. You know how the guys get these collars and they get, you know, dirty around the edges and you don't want to throw it away. Just, I'm not opening up a business for her. I just want to let you know. Uh, But she is the master stain remover. I don't know what she does, but she says I get a bucket and I soak it. There's a difference between a quick rub with a napkin and soaking it. There are some things that need to be soaked in your life. Because we're in a world that is fallen, sin-filled. Think about this. We're not to be a friend of the world. We're not to love the world, James said and John said. We're not to be conformed to the world. We're in the world, but we're not of it. And the Bible says that Jesus was a friend of sinners, yet he was without spot as far as the world was concerned. How many of you know if he went down to minister to someone in the bar, he wasn't drinking with them to convert them? He was relating to them, but not doing what they did. And here's what the scripture says in 1 Peter 1.19. Jesus was the lamb without blemish and without spot. So he was the spotless lamb of God. But we're not spotless But aren't you glad when you've got a stain, you don't call Gigi, you call Jesus. And he has the ultimate stain remover. It's his presence and his blood. So I'm going to give you a couple of reasons why you need to take some time every day or on a regular basis to soak in his presence. And what do you mean by soak, Pastor Mark? Well, that means... Instead of listening to 24-7, and I could be a news junkie, I enjoy politics, and I can do that, but I cannot afford to watch Fox, MSN, CNN 24-7 because it is negative, it is divisive. I mean, get the information, but if, I, if I'm preparing my heart for something, I'm going to put on a praise CD or put on something that's going to build me up. And let me just say, if you have Apple Music or Spotify, you can type in Christian soaking music 
And there are whole albums that are just soaking music. What makes it soaking music? Well, usually there aren't any drums in it. Not that there's anything wrong with drums, but when it's beating all the time, it's hard to really get quiet and listen. And so we need all of that. But there is Christian soaking music, free of charge on YouTube. When you're around your house, create that atmosphere. So let's go a little deeper in this. What do we do when it comes to the presence of God? First of all, five benefits to soaking. Number one, there's communion or fellowship with the Lord. Listen to this verse. This is the closing verse of 2 Corinthians, chapter 13, verse 14. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. We call that a a, a, a closing, a benediction. But listen to this. It's more than that. Notice three key words. The Lord Jesus Christ, or phrases, God the Father and the Holy Spirit. We see the Trinity in that verse. But notice this phrase, the communion of the Holy Spirit. The communion of the Holy Spirit. Now, one translation says the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Did you know that you can fellowship with the Holy Spirit? Did you know that you should fellowship with him? Give me some feedback now. We don't pray to the Holy Spirit. We pray to the Father in Jesus' name. But we can sure fellowship and commune with him. A book that really impacted me many years ago was Benny Hinn's Good Morning, Holy Spirit, where he taught on the communion of the Holy Spirit. Now, when Pastor Stephanie and I had our summer course with uh, Randy Clark's ministry, we had an amazing teacher that came in that taught us on hearing the voice of God. It will be in our Bible school for next year. It's going to be part of our curriculum. And he taught about soaking in the presence of God with a journal. And I was never a journaler. I thought, oh, that, that's just for the ladies. I don't do that. And they said, no, you need a journal. You need to write that down. So I began practicing that, and the Lord told me to give him my summer. And so every morning as I'm getting up, I stretch and do some different things with my legs, and I'll come into church, and I'll put on soaking music, and I'll have my journal there or a piece of paper and a pen, and I just have some worship music, and I just commune with him. I'm not asking for anything. I'm not praying for the nations, although there's a place for all of that. I'm just saying, Lord... What is on your heart today? What are you saying to me? Well, Pastor Mark, you don't know my schedule. I don't, but I know this. Everyone has 10 minutes. Everyone has 15 minutes somewhere. It can be in the car. It can be before the kids get up, whatever the case might be. It is your time to commune in the presence of God. So the first benefit is fellowship with the Lord. Again, not asking for things, not an agenda, just spending time with Him. The second thing is rest and refreshing. How many of you could use some of the two R's, rest and refreshing? Listen to these two passages. This is what God said. And God said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Notice two key phrases, presence with rest. How do you get the rest? Be in his presence. My presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And then Acts 3.19, repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come, how? From the presence of the Lord. Now, the corporate gathering always has a stronger anointing than just you on your own individual time. But aren't you glad you don't have to come to a service to be in his presence? He's just a call away, Lord, I call upon you. I want to be with you. I want to just commune with you. And in his presence, there is rest. And in his presence, there is refreshing. Our goal in the new year is to have more services where we just 
have the presence of God, rest and refreshing. We were limited in many ways because of COVID, but we believe that that's coming to a close, and we have to get back to the presence of Jesus. So the first thing is fellowship with the Lord. The second thing is rest and refreshing. And the third thing is guidance. I don't know about you, but I need guidance on a regular basis. I mean, we're making a lot of crazy. I never went to Bible school and thought I'd have to deal with COVID and a different perspectives politically and all the different environments that we're having right now. But aren't, I'm just, I know this. No matter what I face, the Holy Spirit knows the answers. He has the direction we need. But let's be honest, how many of us get so busy we don't take the time to really say, Lord, speak to my heart. And that's what I like about a soaking service. We have an hour, an hour and 15 minutes just to get our minds quiet because how many of you know your mind doesn't quiet in three minutes? It, it, it gets quiet and then it thinks about the roast and it gets quiet and it thinks about the bills and what about tomorrow? And it takes time to say, I just settle my mind and my body down to be in your presence. In Acts 13, there were five men of God, prophets or teachers or both, that came together. Verse 2 said this, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, what's the next three words? Four words, the Holy Spirit said, or the Spirit said. The Holy Spirit said, in what environment? As they ministered to the Lord. You see, that's what worship is. Because I don't like the worship, I just come for the preaching. That's not the right mentality. You need to be in his presence. That's his portion. That's when you minister to him. And as you do, the Holy Spirit can speak. But we all know that what the scripture says, we're often looking for the wind or for the earthquake or for the fire. Thank God for those things. But usually he speaks in what we call the still small voice or the gentle voice whisper. So if you're hurriedly busy about your life, you'll often miss the gentle whisper. And one of the things we were taught this summer is as you wait upon the Lord, there may be these thoughts that just run through your mind and you'll say, oh, that's not God, that's just me. Write them down anyway. And I begin to realize this, we hear from the Lord way more often than we think we do. I'll say that again, we hear from the Lord Way more often than we think we do, we just don't recognize that it's him. And so as we quiet ourselves down, write those thoughts down and say, Lord, I'll be looking at that, praying over that, asking someone else about that. There's nothing wrong with saying, I'm sensing this. Could you judge this? Could you give me your thoughts about that? So number three, in his presence, there is guidance. Number four is the joy of, of the Lord. We could all use some joy at this time. And here's the great thing. The joy that is already on the inside, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. The joy that is already on the inside rises to the outside when we allow the Lord to minister to us. Have you ever come to church feeling down and discouraged and struggling, and by the end of worship, you're through that, you're over that as you're magnifying God, and by the end of the message, you're ready to run through a, a troop and leap over a wall? Why? Because what was on the inside began to come to the outside. It's important to keep that joy up by being in his presence. Give me a verse, Pastor Mark. Psalm 1611 you will show me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy. In your presence is fullness of joy. And then number five, strength. The good news is there's not just strength for one part of you. You are a spirit. You know this. You have a soul and you live in a body. There is strength for the whole man, spirit, soul, and body. Now, you might say, Pastor Mark, I'm just not sure about calling it soaking. That's fine. Let's call it what the Bible calls it, waiting on the Lord. 
believe soaking is accurate too. But listen to this, Isaiah 40, 30, you know, uh, and 31, you know this. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall, but those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Supernatural strength is available when we take the time to be in his presence. We need to value that presence. Again, it doesn't have to be long. It doesn't even have to be here. But turning off all all of the world's noise to say, Lord, I'm going to spend time with you. You know, with Adam and Eve, God created them for fellowship. And the scripture says that he would come at the cool of the day and talk to them. Now, when is the cool of the day? Well, some people say it's morning. Some people say it's evening. I believe it could be either one. It basically is when the sun isn't up high. So it can be the morning for you. It can be the evening. It could be the afternoon if that works best. But have a time where you say, Lord, I shut off all the noise, and I just spend some time fellowshipping with you. Now, I want to give some practical things that you can do to implement this in your life. And I strongly encourage you to do that. I know Christians, they get burned out. They're, you know, they can't handle life's difficulties. That shows me not to judge, but they're probably not in his presence as they need to be. Number one, a couple of things you can do. Set aside some time just to soak in his presence. Not to listen to a teaching, although we love that. Not to go to a prayer meeting, although we believe in that. Just to soak and to rest and to listen. Something about that, we believe in using our prayer language. I pray in the Holy Spirit every day. But when we're soaking, that really isn't the time to be just praying in the Spirit. Just get quiet. You can just talk to the Lord in your heart. Lord, I just get quiet. I just want to fellowship with you. I just want to hear your heart. I want to be like John that puts my my head on, on your shoulder and just listens to your heart. Take some time to do that. Don't give God at that time your shopping list. God, I know you're busy, but I've got nine things we, we need to deal with now. There's a time for that, but this is that time just to spend fellowshipping with him. As you do that, allow him to minister to you. A second thing, invite the Holy Spirit to minister afresh. Now, the Bible says in Psalm 92, I was anointed with fresh oil. How many of you know that every three to 5,000 miles, your car needs an oil change? Now, it doesn't necessarily mean you don't have any oil. It just gets soiled, stained, dirty. You see, when you get new oil, it's clean, and it looks very different after so many miles. You pull out the dipstick, and it's black, and it looks like it's been really used you need every you know, pens oil lets you know your time's up. Okay, 3,000 miles. We got a deal going. It's time for some fresh oil. Well, how many of you know if you're going to serve God for the length of your days, it may be some time for some fresh oil in your life? So, how do I get a spiritual oil change soaking in His presence? I'm not saying you lose the Holy Spirit, you don't, you never lose Him. But I am saying you can become stained by being in the world, even if you're not involved in it, just being around it. How do you get rid of that stain? Soaking it out, being with him. A couple of other things. Secondly, invite the Holy Spirit to minister afresh to you. Holy Spirit, just come. He comes where he's welcomed. Remember the Bible verse that says, I stand in the door and knock. If any man open the door, I will come in. That verse is not written to believers or unbelievers. It's written to believers. I stand at the door of your heart and I knock. I remember Jerry Savelle telling a great story of a 
uh, many years ago when, when racism was a bigger issue and there was an African-American that was invited to sing to a church down south and they did not realize the skin color and so he came to preach and when the deacons recognized he was different, they said, I'm sorry, you can't speak here. And they sent him home, which is horrible. But in the midst of that, he was saying, Lord, it's just not fair. They invited me, and then they, they won't allow me to speak. And the Holy Spirit said, that's okay, son. I've been trying to get into that church for years, and they don't let me in either. So we need to let him in. Say, Holy Spirit, I know you're dwelling in me, but I want you to refresh me. I want you to speak to my heart. A couple of other things. Number three, endeavor to quiet your mind and focus on the Lord. And I'll be honest with you. When I come to a soaking service, the first 10 minutes, the music's playing, but I'm, my mind isn't quiet yet. I'm thinking about all of these things, and then all of a sudden, I begin to get my mind quiet, and then I think about some, I don't think about the roast. That's not my area of expertise, but I'm thinking about something I've got to do tomorrow or something I need to do later that day. No, I'm going to pull my mind back in. It takes time to get still and focus. And there's nothing wrong with that. We're so used to going and blowing and moving, our mind isn't used to being still. Here's what the Scripture says. We know it well. Be still and know that I am God. And that phrase, be still, here's what it says in one's translation. Stop striving. Stop striving. And how many of you know sometimes we can be striving to help God out in some things? Pastor Stephanie had a great prophetic song today about the burden of the Lord. And as I've been dealing with this physical issue, I said, Lord, I believe in speaking the word and I believe in doing what I need to do, but it's not like I have to have so many confessions or do so many things. I've been healed by the grace of God and I'm going to rest in you. So I believe the heart of the Father is don't strive. Be still and know that he is God. And the last thing I want to say is this, and I mentioned this earlier. Keep a journal or a writing pad with you. Because I've found many times when the Lord, now here's the cool thing about a smartphone. You actually have something where you can press it and you can speak into it and dictate to yourself or you can play a video. A lot of times when people get prophecies, they just, what's the app for that? You just have a video app and you just press it and it tapes things. So there's so many ways you can do it. But when the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart, don't say, I'll remember that forever. No, probably not. Write it down. If you get a prophetic word, write it down. Why? You, anytime someone gives me a prophetic word, I'll say, I was blessed by that. But three months from now, I won't remember that. Please write it down. Give me the essence of that. I want to keep that. And so keep a journal next to you. And as the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart, even if it seems like a small thing, write it down. The last thing I want to say is this. I read something this week on Facebook that I thought was really good. I don't know anything about this particular gentleman. But I'll just say this. Be still, the Bible says. And I would say stay still. Because how many of you know you can turn on the news or read a news report and get so rattled or so angry or so jarred by some of the things that are happening? happening? And here's the reality. Many of these things are totally out of our control. How many of you know you can't solve Afghanistan yourself, right? Now, we should pray. We need to do that. We should write to our congressmen, our senators about things. We should do all of those things. I believe in all of that but there are many things that are out of our power. And I read this, and I thought this was really good. Be careful with too much news. We're the first generation in all of human history who has 24-7 access to all the world's problems at our fingertips. How many of you would agree with that? I mean, if there is an earthquake in Kathmandu, The whole world hears about it by the morning. Not that that's wrong, but we're the first generation in all of human history who has 24-7 access to all the world's problems at our fingertips. Technology has outpaced the human capacity to handle that information. Now, a psychologist is saying amen right now. We weren't meant to process all the world's chaos. And when we try, 
it only creates stress, anxiety, and frustration. Have an idea of what's happening in the world and in your specific community, but also have peace in knowing that you can't solve the world's problems. Do what you can do to love your family, serve your community, and make a positive impact where you can, but sleep in peace knowing the rest is in God's hand. I thought that was really good. Now, I do believe in being informed. I'm not saying be uninformed. But you can be informed in 15 or 20 minutes. If you have something on 24-7, that's not an information. That's probably disinformation and a lot of fear coming into your heart. The world's news creates fear. God's word creates faith. Fear comes just the same way faith comes. By hearing. What is most of your hearing about? Make sure it's faith filled and not fear filled. I believe this is a season where God is calling us to draw back to Him. There's so many things that can grab our attention. And one of the things I've seen with COVID is people, oh, I'm good, I'm fine, I don't need to be a part of a family. Listen to me. I'll tell you this church is absolutely essential. I said church is absolutely essential. I'm grateful for Facebook Live when it's needed. I'm grateful for the tools and the videos when it's needed. But we need to connect with one another. We need to be a family within the family of God. It's not enough just to say, I watch it. That's good. But when the Bible says, call for the elders of the church, you need to have that relationship where you can come and get prayer and get ministry and, and, and serve. You can't serve via a video. Now, some people have no other option. I get that. They have to watch it that way. They're older. They're maybe struggling with something. I get that. But we're called to give, not just receive. I feel led to do something we haven't done in a long time. If anyone's not comfortable coming down, that's okay. I get that. Maybe just come, come closer and just sit in a seat. But I want us as a family, the family of God, to rededicate our hearts, to be in his presence, draw near to him, and not allow anything to come between us and Jesus. I heard Oprah Winfrey Oprah Winfrey say she began to pull away from God when she found out he was a jealous God. And she said, if he's jealous, I don't want him in my life. That's, that's an insecurity. God isn't jealous of you. He's perfect. He's jealous for you. He isn't jealous of you. He's jealous for you. He made the earth in its fullness for you, to fellowship with you. People say, I'm sorry, got to go swimming, got to ride a bike, got to do something. We just don't have the time to be in his presence. I'm not talking about you, but so many. I'm good, I'm fine, got things to do, people to see, I'm tired. Let's get back to fellowshipping with our Creator.